Welcome back to SABC News and we're coming to you live from the manufacturing in Daba being held here in the Santon Convention Center in northern Johannesburg. Now manufacturing, why is it so important? Because factories, we're, we're talking about factories that make things locally here and they are a huge source of job creation. But manufacturing as a sector has been in a very slow but steady decline since its heyday in the 1990s where our factories were flying. A lot of that, uh, some of the analysts here are attributing to isolation, to protectionism, uh, the kind of things that the United States is trying to do to ensure that its factories are protected. But we opened ourselves up to competition from the world and manufacturing now only accounting for about 12 to 13 percent uh, contributing uh, that amount to overall GDP or overall economic economic output. Government here saying that it would like to increase uh, that contribution to make sure that we are self-sufficient, that we're not importing everything. Uh, we've seen countries before relying on retail sales, relying on a strong financial sector. But when the financial crisis came, that was devastating uh, because they didn't have a strong manufacturing base. Now, one of the topics today is Japan and China, their relationship with Africa. Remember, cheap Chinese textiles uh, basically at one stage wiped out the South African textile industry because it was so much cheaper to import Chinese goods and South African manufacturers simply could not compete. So what they're discussing today uh, earlier on in one of the talks upstairs was how do we deal with that? Uh, is there now a gap because China is moving from low cost manufacturing to more high cost quality manufacturing, possibly an opportunity for other people who can come in at lower cost. Otherwise, we have to compete at the higher level where China is going uh, towards quality manufacturing goods that may cost a little bit more. Earlier, I spoke to Cheryl Ann Smith. She's from Wikistrat, kind of looking at trends uh, about manufacturing, where the globe is going. Let's listen to what she had to say. African nations have been suffering and um, the manufacturing sector needs a, a reignition of what is going on. So we have to look at the weaknesses in China's relations that we have and also what we can do to actually take advantage of those weaknesses. Like China's basically moved to adapting its own uh, manufacturing industries in order to move from quantity to quality um, because they want to keep the population appeased. So if African nations actually want to take advantage, they now have to move in that direction as well in order to compete with China and compete in the global manufacturing arena. Scale. So, so you've touched on one of the problems uh, and a lot of the analysts are saying we opened up maybe even too early. So our manufacturers had to compete with China that started off doing really low cost goods now you're saying they're moving to quality, but they've always been uh, so efficient in, in manufacturing. So tell me a bit more. How, how do we compete when our costs aren't low and, and maybe we still have quality issues? Where, where is the gap? Well, look, you have to look at this from China's perspective. There's, there's major dilemmas when China's going to have to elevate its manufacturing industry in the next 20, uh, in 2025. The thing is that China has an aging population. China does not have arable land to feed its people and Chinese local suppliers will be unable to meet um, the Chinese needs when it comes to the related components for the robotics industries that have to be accelerated for manufacturing activities. Now what Africa sits with again is we have the natural resources but we need to modernize our manufacturing industry so we can produce our own value added goods and we have a young population that needs to be brought into the fold and upskilled so that they can be a part of this new generation of manufacturing. And, and isn't it uh, terrifying for them that maybe the robots will be doing a lot of work? Can you still harness that that young population? No, definitely you can still harness the young population. At the end of the day, what everybody needs to understand is that no matter what industry you're in, the organizational structure of the industry is going to change. So you're going to need cybersecurity analysts. You're going to need data analysts. You're going to need people who can understand 
what the technology is about. Policy analysts will have to be more proactive rather than reactive when it comes to certain issues. Take, for example, an autonomous um, vehicle manufacturer. They can't just place the car on the roads anymore because we can't apply the same uh, policies that we have now for ordinary vehicles that we have. We have to have policy analysts and your manufacturers working collaborative, collaboratively with one another so that you can actually foresee all the different implications of this technology if something happens. You're talking about very high skilled technical analytical work. Given our education, do you, do you think we can get there? Look, um, we're going to have to start somewhere, and that is obviously at your low-level school area, which is your kindergarten, your because they, these are the youngsters that are actually using the technology to so understand it. Um, but obviously, your your tertiary education institutions have to bring in the the incorporate the fourth industrial revolution courses now for for the youngsters to understand that this is where we're heading. I think people don't know how to balance the act at this moment in time and they're trying to find ways and means to do so. But the other thing is what the youth need to understand is that they cannot just depend on governments to help them and tertiary institutions to help them. There are other ways you can upskill. There are massive open online courses um, that they can utilize and they can decide what skills they want to learn and they can shape their own destiny. Final question. So you were on this panel looking at uh, China and Japan and Africa, the partnership, where the gaps are. Can we learn from China and Japan instead of seeing their manufactured imports as a, as a threat? Look, um, we can always learn from anybody. The thing is what we need to, to understand is that where we're learning is if we, especially in South Africa, we cannot isolate ourselves in the BRICS countries anymore. We have to keep our relations open with other manufacturing parts because we're missing out on opportunities such as Japan and South Korea who are leading advanced countries. And the thing is the geopolitical landscape is changing so quickly in a blink of an eye with the drop of a tweet from Donald Trump that you actually have to take advantage of the situations that are coming up now. So that was Cheryl Ann Smith, one of the panelists on one of the discussions, uh, government officials, business people, manufacturers themselves, putting their heads together to say, how do we cope uh, with the changes in manufacturing when our industry is already struggling and uh, the fourth industrial revolution, this high tech world uh, is coming towards us at a pace. And uh, while that's going on upstairs, downstairs, uh, here you'll see some of the exhibitionists, uh, the halls, are filled and a lot more people today and some of them are saying they are making sales they are getting noticed but this all wraps up at about 4 30 today here at the Sankton, uh, Sankton Convention Center so from the manufacturing in Daba that's a wrap from us